thanks for everybody, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to present uh, this, uh, uh, these slides. Uh, I will try not to repeat the same things uh, again that have been uh, told before. Uh, there were many things, uh, very interesting talks. Uh, the same time, sometimes it's, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting to see different uh, versions of, of the same thing, a uh, view from different angles, uh, that helps also to understand. So I'll try to be complementary. Uh, my, in my talk, I will talk about RF thruster. I will define what, I'm talking, um, uh, what is an RF thruster, what I mean by that. Uh, I will talk about the technology, but I will also have a part of my talk, the second part of my talk will be on diagnostics. Uh, two diagnostics, one on specifically on RF thruster and one uh, that is complementary to the very nice talk from uh, Professor Conde uh, this morning, and that will be uh, an optical diagnostic laser-induced fluorescence. First, uh, a word about uh, ONERA, uh, since I'm from ONERA. ONERA is the French uh, Aerospace uh, Research Center. Uh, we do uh, both fundamental and applied research uh, for aeronautics and space. Uh, we have a lot of wind tunnels, we work on radars and optical uh, systems uh, for astronomy and also on, uh, on plasma physics. So first, uh, as an introduction, I will talk a little bit, I will come back a little bit, of, uh, and probably maybe the only questions I will, I will put uh, here for the thruster part. Um, I will start from the basics. Uh, so you remember, I hope now uh, you understand what's the interest of electric propulsion. This is the thrust uh, equal uh, mass flow rate times velocity. If you increase the velocity by 10 uh, for the same thrust or same maneuver, then you decrease the mass flow rate of the needed mass by 10. That's the advantage. So now if you go to the exercise for like a, a launcher, uh, I, put, I wanted to look at the thrust and the power that we need. So. Uh, for a rocket, like Ariane 5, you have a thrust that uh, the order of magnitude is 100 ton, uh, and a power, chemical power uh, that is about 1 gigawatt. Now, if you want to go to electric propulsion with that, um, you will decrease uh, the flow rate that you need, and so the mass of the rocket for the same thrust, because you have an exhaust velocity which is 10 times higher. But if you look at that equation, what you have to remember is that to provide the thrust, you have to expel matter that has momentum, that's what uh, you, 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 you get, but also that has energy. And energy goes at the square of the velocity. So if you increase, as in electric propulsion, by 10, the velocity, we increase this term by 100. Uh, well, since you decrease the, the mass flow rate by 10, you still increase the power by factor 10. So you, ten, you need 10 gigawatts of electricity. And uh, the problem is that uh, uh, not only is it 10 times larger than chemical propulsion, but it's electricity. So here, one gigawatt, you need chemicals, you need a, 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 like a, a booster. A 10 gigawatt of electricity, uh, you need uh, one or several uh, power stations, uh, nuclear power stations to do that. And so uh, what you realize quickly is that, okay, I have to divide that by 10 million, and then we'll get into numbers that are matters for electric propulsion. Uh, and fortunately, when you are in space for satellites, you don't have to fight against gravity, so you don't care to have a small thrust, uh, and, and therefore that can work. So here we go to 10 gram thrust, uh, and that's one kilowatt electricity, or uh, 100 gram thrust, that's about one newton, and then you get uh, 10 kilowatt, 10 to 20 kilowatts. Uh, of electricity, and that's about the current status of the art for electric propulsion. So uh, uh, for now and the next uh, probably couple hundred years, we're not going to fly a rocket uh, f with electric propulsion from the ground. Now another uh, advantage of electric propulsion, as was uh, mentioned before, but I wanted to show the, this graph because it's interesting, is because of this equation which is exponential in, uh, in, in the exhaust velocity. Uh, you can draw this graph very simply, which is uh, you want to propel one ton uh, outside of the solar system, so you want to, to get the, ex the, uh, uh, the velocity of 40 kilometers per second. And what is the initial mass necessar necessary to propel one ton of payload at 40 kilometers per second as a function of the exhaust velocity? And you see that when you are uh, about the exhaust velocity a few kilometers per second of chemical uh, propulsion, then you have a th several thousands of tons necessary, whereas when you have electric propulsion exhaust velocity, you get only a few tons necessary. So uh, not only you have an economic uh, viewpoint about electric propulsion, but that's probably the only way that you will go do far away mission in the future. Now, I will go back to the very basic of, of, uh, of propulsion. So the common principle of all the rockets and all the systems is to get to momentum in one direction. So Newton, uh, Newton's law means that you have action and reaction, so you need to release something uh, to get more momentum. 
Now, uh, there are derogations for some thrusters, so this is a bit of a joke because uh, there is, a, maybe you've heard about it, but there is a thruster called the EM drive, uh, which claims that, uh, in fact, it can do without Newton's law and uh, create, in fact, it's an RF device, so it's uh, very on purpose for this presentation. Uh, basically, you have a microwave, you put microwave into an asymmetrical cavity, and by pushing on the vacuum energy or something like that, uh, you get a thrust. Um, it's not proven yet, okay, uh, and so I think Newton's is uh, okay for now. Uh, but besides for those thr this thruster, all the thruster they need to release some something. So you can release photons. So for example, a flashlight is a thruster, okay, it's an electric uh, propulsion device. Uh, but you won't get far. There are, that's where all the solar cells come set from. Or you can release particles. So neutrons, okay, uh, is not very uh, practical. Electrons and positive ions, because again. Uh, as was said before, you need to be neutral. You need to release as many positive charges as negative charges because you need to keep your spacecraft neutral. If not, it will increase in potential and then it will uh, prevent any particle from, uh, from escaping. Uh, or atoms and molecules, and that's rockets. Now, the process of accelerating can do different things. You can uh, take an isotropic, uh, basically heating. Uh, so isotropic means all directions, and then you convert that into the direction uh, that you want. That's with a, 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 a mechanical uh, nozzle, and that's what doing a rocket. Or you can do an anisotropic uh, acceleration, or longitudinal, or you can do also uh, use an anisotropic uh, heating in the transverse direction, but then you have also to convert it to the forward direction. And that's done also with a nozzle, like, uh, like the gas heating uh, side, uh, but that's a magnetic nozzle. So uh, if I want to put that in a table to give you an idea of uh, how uh, to, a classification basically to tell you where RF uh, thrusters are, uh, these are uh, energy mode that where you put on a thruster. So you have longitudinal directly, longitudinal transverse with a magnetic node with a nozzle or, or heating with a, with a nozzle. And you have the different means, the, 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 the different uh, vector of your, the thrust that you, that you use, either the gas directly or the electrons, which will pull the ions to stand neutral, or the ions, and then they will pull the electrons. And that's where non equilibrium plasma happens. So you, for ISO, in, in the first, the gas, you don't have those uh, uh, kind of uh, weird uh, uh, direct action. You have only the heating action. So you have a cold gas so without heating, just ca compressed gas. Then you have a resistor jet, so in, in, uh, in pink it's where you have a plasma. Uh, you start to have a plasma, so you can heat the gas with a resistor. Uh, electrothermal, so arc jet and microwave electrothermal, so then you get uh, more heating. Uh, chemical reaction, you can get even more heating. And then uh, you can have uh, nuclear thermal uh, rockets uh, where you can heat the gas with a nuclear reaction. Now on the other, with the electrons, uh, you can directly uh, push the electrons with uh, uh, and, and, and then the ions with the, the force, with the Laplace force, that's the MPD. Uh, you can uh, excite the electron in transverse mode, so that's done partially in ECR, and then you use a magnetic nozzle. And in another tropic way, so you can use any, any plasma with a magnetic nozzle and you get something going out if you hit enough. Uh, but that's also uh, the way the, the, the helicon thrusters are working. And now if you want to push directly on the ions, then that's the electrostatic thrusters. You put a voltage and you accelerate the ions uh, uh, directly longitudinally. Uh, but you can also uh, accelerate them in a transverse way like we did here uh, with the, the ECR and with the electrons. And that's called ICR, it's ion cyclotron resonance, and you still need a magnetic nozzle. Now, if we want to put that also in another way, we can look at the physics and how we are accelerating things. And that's more interesting because you get into how the thruster works. Uh, first, I put all the, the acronyms for those who don't know here. You can refer to that. Uh, those acronyms are all the, the different thrusters or categories of thrusters that uh, kind of exist uh, right now. So um, I, in this graph, I put the thrust going out of the, uh, of the wall. And in this first column, the electric field also is going out of the wall means along the thrust. And so do you accelerate directly uh, ions with the electric field, so that gridded ion engines, a FIP, etc. Now if you add a magnetic field, and uh, Professor Aedo uh, described why you need a magnetic field uh, to keep the electrons, for example, in some configurations, uh, then you get into another type of thrusters uh, with uh, both electric, longitudinal electric, and radial uh, magnetic field, whole effect thrusters, and, uh, and hemp. Now, if you rotate the electric field on the side, then you have both magnetic field and electric field radial. 
And then you use the Laplace force, uh, the E cross B force, uh, to, 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 or J cross B force, to work on the thruster. And that's the realm of the MPD thruster and the pulse plasma thrusters that use that. And now, if you also move B this, this time in a longitudinal way, in the magnetic field, then you get in the column of the magnetic nozzle thrusters. So now it's the electric field, which is radial, and the magnetic field, which is longitudinal. So it's really an opposite concept, basically, of a whole thruster uh, in terms of orientations of, of, of the fields. And that's where you have ECR thruster, uh, helicon thruster, and the uh, Vasimir, which is the ICR thruster. So here it's where I call electrostatic thruster, so we can discuss the definition of a whole effect thruster, but basically in a whole effect thruster, like in other, in this column, uh, you put 300 volt and you have 300 volt ions at the end, so uh, in, it's, it's, it is in this sense that it is electrostatic. Um, and also here I mentioned that there are, these are neutralizerless or cathodeless uh, thrusters, so you don't need to neutralize. So here, because you push the whole plasma together, uh, you push uh, the electrons and the ions all together with the process. And here, uh, it's, uh, the, we had a presentation yesterday uh, about that. It's because you, it's a, those are, for example, gridded ion thrusters or electro spray, uh, where you uh, have uh, bi use bipolar, basically, thrusters. So you expel uh, positive and negative ions uh, as a, in a repetitive way to get something uh, globally neutral. But uh, the thruster we're interesting here in this presentation, or rather in this column, in the magnetic nozzle uh, column. So uh, I'll finish this uh, brief presentation of all the different uh, uh, thruster technologies by showing you a little bit of uh, illustration of that. Uh, here uh, in this column, you have what we call the mature technologies that have been uh, uh, studied for years. Maybe not ready yet, but we kind of know how they work. <laughs> Uh, with the MPDs and PPTs. And these are the column of the new technologies that are being developed right now, the Helicon, the ECR. Although the ECR have been known for some time, but uh, really there was not much uh, done uh, in the past uh, uh, on this technology. So uh, a little bit of definition about what an RF thruster is also. Um, but when you have a thruster, you usually have an acceleration and ionization process. So the best way to think about it is when they are dissociated like in the uh, ion engine. So first you have an ionization, but that doesn't take a lot of power. That takes uh, tens of watts, for example, to ionize the gas. And then you have the acceleration. And that's where, uh, uh, fortunately, that's where all the power goes, uh, because that's where you will put the energy for uh, uh, and the momentum in the gas. And so you have uh, tens or maybe 100 power, uh, 100 of watts of power for ionization and uh, kilowatts of power in the acceleration. So really the process and the, the power supply, I would say, that is of interest and that you have to optimize when you do electric propulsion is the one for acceleration and not too much the one for ionization. There are other constraints for ionization in terms of uniformity and so on, but in terms of power, that's not the one you want to, uh, to optimize. So uh, now, having said that, I will look a few examples of our first thrust. On the grid ion engines, we saw that uh, uh, the, 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 the acceleration is then for grids, but there are several ways to do the discharge, as was earlier said. You can have uh, like kinetic uh, DC discharge that was presented, so it's a Kaufman type. You can have an RF discharge in the megahertz range, that's a read developed by uh, ion group. So you have like a coil around a, a, a vessel here where you put the gas and the grids are expelling. And you can also have an ECR uh, gigahertz uh, uh, range, the gigahertz range uh, developed in Japan for the Hayabusa uh, probe. So uh, these are RF thrusters, but they're not really, in my sense, RF thrusters. That's not, not, what, not what I'm talking about, because here the RF, as I say, used only for the ionization, not the acceleration. The acceleration is still done by a DC voltage. So they are still gridded ion thruster, but that's not really what I call RF thrusters. Then you have the microwave electrothermal. Uh, you hit the gas with microwave, and the gas expands in a, in a mechanical nozzle. Then that's an RF thruster, OK, but that's I uh, hope there are no electrothermal people in the room, but uh, that's not a noble RF uh, thruster in the sense that uh, it's, it's, uh, the, the ISP is, is rather low compared to other thruster. Uh, the technology is simple. Uh, and, and, uh, and what we mean by RF thruster is really those complex thrusters where you use RF uh, power. So then we go into the, the, the heart of the RF uh, thruster, which are the ICR acceleration uh, in Vasimir. Uh, the ionization here also is dissociated, uh, like in a, a gridded ion thruster. Uh, the ionization is done by a helicon discharge. And the acceleration, where the real, all the power is used, is by uh, ICR, so megahertz discharge. So it's uh, uh, basically it's the cyclotron resonance, but with ions, not electrons. So you need a much higher electric field. 
Then you have the ECR thruster, which I will present a little bit more detail uh, later, and you have uh, the helicon thruster. Uh, another uh, uh, point of confusion also uh, that uh, you can be seen is uh, with uh, talking about ECR thrusters. So you see uh, these in red are uh, the th three ECR thrusters, but uh, they, are all, they are very different. Uh, this you ionize with ECR thruster, these you just heat, and this one is where you have this complex process of a cyclotron resonance that will uh, hit the electron and that will convert them to a magnetic nozzle. So, uh, and, and sometimes uh, in the conferences, uh, when I have a paper on uh, my ECNR uh, magnetic nozzle thruster, uh, they put me with a microwave electrothermal thruster and I'm not very happy because it's not exactly the same uh, technology. But anyway, uh, you have to be careful when you read things about ECR thruster and R thruster. There are seven types of, uh, of each. Now, uh, coming to RF thrusters, uh, which where you have a heating of the gas with RF and expansion, uh, there are several uh, advantages of these RF thrusters, like ECR and ICR, like Vasimir or Helicon thrusters. First, you don't need a neutralizer. Uh, you don't need a cathode, and that's really a help in the laboratory. Uh, um, no offense to the whole effect and the gridded ion thruster uh, people, but it really makes life much easier. You don't have to worry about uh, gas impurities. You don't have to worry about uh, having a very very good base vacuum or waiting for, for, for heating of the cathode, etc. Uh, so it's really nice, and of course, it's a cost advantage. Uh, you don't need electrodes, you don't have grids, okay? Uh, in this uh, thruster configuration, you, the plasma just uh, is, is expelled and is accelerated. You have one power supply. Uh, you have also some magnetic, some level of magnetic shielding uh, with the uh, longitudinal magnetic field because those RF thrusters have a longitudinal magnetic field. You can have magnetic thrust vest storing and you can use many propellants. So really, the advantage of these RF thrusters are the simpler design, the lower costs, the higher reliability and hopefully, and that has to be demonstrated, uh, the longer lifetime. Of course, they have to reach the same performance as other thrusters if they want to be competitive. Uh, but what is sure is the simpler design and the lower cost, and thus higher reliability. Then we have to prove, and that's all the work of research on these thrusters, that they can have a lifetime at least equal or, or sufficient for the application that they, uh, that they target, and also an, uh, an efficiency that is, uh, that is uh, also uh, uh, consistent with their application. Applications. And so talking about different gas uh, being used for RF and the RF thruster not caring about the gas, here are a few illustrations of, uh, we played a little bit and put different things in our thrusters. Uh, air here for uh, demonstrate, okay, air breathing, CO2 is for Mars breathing. Of course, we have to, uh, to study the performance in all those gases, but at least it's, uh, it's possible. So a uh, principle about uh, one of the RF thrusters, the ECR thruster. Uh, the ECR thruster works by uh, having a resonance between uh, an electric field uh, and a magnetic field. So you have an electron in the magnetic field, the electron goes into a rotational motion around the magnetic field lines at a certain frequency. Okay, the frequency is a function of the magnetic field intensity. And if you put a microwave power in, at that frequency, so for 875 Gauss, the frequency is 2.45 gigahertz. Then the, f the, the, the electric field, the alternative electric field that you will put in the gas will be in phase with the electron turning around the magnetic field lines. And so they will accelerate continuously the electron along the magnetic field line. This is the ECR resonance. When you reach that, uh, then you have a very high ionization. You can reach very high electron temperature. And electron temperature, as you've seen, we've heard before in the talks and uh, I've mentioned, is a, a driver of these, uh, of these systems. So the principle of operation here is a, a, a ECR a thruster with a, a central antenna, some magnetic field to create those uh, magnetic field lines that are diverging, and uh, the electrons that are turning around the magnetic field line. So you have the ECR, so at some point in the, in the, in the thruster, you have an ECR region where you have the magnetic field and the, the electric field are, that are in phase. Uh, there, that's where you hit, hit the electrons. Then, uh, because you hit, the, you hit the electrons very much, they kind of blow up the plasma downstream. Uh, the electrons will follow because the plasma is dense, but also they can convert this lateral movement into a, a, a forward movement uh, by a conversion in this magnetic nozzle, just like a gas that is uh, as it's a, a, a random a thermal movement converted into a forward movement by a mechanical nozzle. And that creates uh, basically an ion and electron flow coming out. So there is a neutral plasma coming out and it's a catalyst thruster. And uh, the, the, uh, the key here is that the acceleration of the ions is in fact DC. 
So in this region of the plume, uh, downstream, you have a DC field that exists that will uh, uh, accelerate the ions and slow down the electrons. So another way to look at it is to, to feel that, okay, initially when you start your thruster, you will heat up the electrons very much because th they react to the electric field and not the ions. So they will go fast, they will go out very fast uh, out of this thruster. Now, of course, uh, when they, you leave electrons, you miss some electrons, your thruster potential will go up or your plasma potential will go up. So the effect of that is that it will, this plasma potential, positive plasma potential will repel ions, so accelerate ions away from this positive potential. And at the same time, it will bring the electrons or, or, or reduce the speed or the flux of the electrons. And basically, this potential will go up until you have equilibrium between the flux of ion going out and the flux of electron going out. And so this uh, potential goes to the point where uh, f there are very few electrons that are coming out and they equal the ions that are coming out. And that's a system that uh, the principle uh, happens uh, by itself. We don't have to do anything. And it happens that we get electron, uh, sorry, ion energy on the order of a few hundreds of EVs and that are relevant for electric propulsion. And so in the realization that we're working on, uh, so this is the principle, this is the thruster. Uh, those, this, the, you, you see here, you have a big magnet here on the back of the thruster and you have uh, magnetic field lines and you have ECR region and this is the plume, okay? Uh, so we work at uh, 50 watt in this demonstration. So of course, all the, the when I say we work is because uh, all the, um, the RF thrusters have much less maturity than all the thrusters we talked about, the whole effect thrusters and the ion thrusters. All effect and ion thrusters uh, have been uh, flying for decades on satellites. Uh, RF thrusters, uh, whether it's ECR or helicon thrusters, are not well understood yet. I mean, there are some performances, uh, but they are not uh, the, the real performances needed for to propel a spacecraft have not been achieved yet. And so, there is still some research to be done and some improvement to be done. Uh, but there are some uh, uh, a lot of work now done uh, on these uh, on this type of thruster. But still, they give good results in terms of, uh, of, of thrust and of uh, ion energy. And uh, as you can see here, we can go, we could measure. Uh, those are our ion uh, uh, graph of ion energy distribution. So there is a peak here uh, in this situation. We're at 400 dV uh, for, uh, for the ion beam. Uh, so that's really uh, consistent uh, for, uh, for, electron, um, uh, for, for electric propulsion application. Now, there are a few, uh, a few challenges. One is the complex physics uh, that you have to model uh, because uh, whether it's a whole, um, uh, helicon thruster or ECR thruster uh, as RF thruster, you have to deal with uh, alternative uh, high frequency wave and, and even waves that are on the, size, uh, on the other side of the thruster, so you have to wave propagation. And on top of that, you have coupled acceleration and ionization zone. So it's very difficult to model. You also, in those RF thrusters, compared to the other thrusters that we talked about so far, uh, you do not have a direct measure of the ion current and ion energy that you are putting out. For example, in a, in a DC, uh, in a gridded ion engine, uh, you put some voltage, uh, 2 kilovolts, so you know your ions will be 2,000 two, 2, EV, and you, have, you measure the current and you know uh, you have 1 amp, so you, have, you know you have approximately 1 amp uh, in your beam. In the RF thrusters, you put some RF power uh, to 200 watts, and you have no clue what's in the beam, uh, whether you have 10 EV ions or 200 EV ions, or whether uh, your mass fraction or your ionization fraction is 1% or 100%. So you have to measure that in vacuum or with thrust balance. And so it's much more difficult to have even a first order measurement uh, of, the, of the performances. Okay, and another thing is that uh, we need very good vacuum level on these RF thrusters. Uh, maybe a vacuum level about 10 times better than uh, the other type of thrusters because probably of this magnetic nozzle physics and that we're estimating why. But these are, for example, several sc angular scan of, um, uh, of ion beam. Uh, so you see there is a peak at the center and then there are, there are tails here. Uh, already, you start here at 210 to the minus 5 millibar. It's already pretty high for us, okay? But then you go, you go to, to, from 2.5 to 3.4 to 6.4 and to the minus 5 millibar, and you see that the, the, the ion profile is get very ugly, uh, very fast. Uh, but at this pressure, you, should, you, you are able to run the whole effect thruster pretty well. So really, we need better pressure, we need bigger vacuum tanks also. And as an illustration, uh, 
of vacuum tanks, why you need big vacuum tanks, why you need big, uh, mostly for the pumping, because you need a lot of pumps, and pumps are cryogenic in electric propulsion, okay? So contrary to, for example, you've, maybe you've seen a large vacuum tanks when you put satellites in there, so there are thermal vacuum, uh, uh, thermal vacuum tank. Uh, to, thermo, to do thermal cycles on the satellite, you don't need uh, a very high pumping because you pump once and then uh, there is a satellite in there, there is no gas inflow, so you don't need very good large pump. For electric propulsion, you have to fight against a thruster that's putting out a lot of gas. And so you need large pumps. And pumps, there are no mechanical pumps at this stage, it's condensation pumps, so cryo pumps, and you have meter square. Of, of, of pumps needed and so very large vacuum chambers. You have to put also the, 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 the end of the chamber farthest away from the thruster so that uh, the ions, when they impact the, thrust, the, the, the vacuum tank, you have some sputtering, so there is uh, some material that is uh, 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 taken from the wall and that will uh, sputter everywhere and you have to want to be far from that. And also you want a large size because uh, the walls of the vacuum chamber, uh, they constitute a boundary condition, electrical boundary condition for the thruster. It may interact with the plume. That's why you want big vacuum chambers, and as a big vacuum chamber go, this one is pretty big. This is an example. Uh, this is the Boeing vacuum chamber, where you have a lot of, uh, of pumps. So all those small uh, round things are cryo pumps. So this is to give you an idea of uh, what a big vacuum chamber for electric propulsion uh, looks like. So I finished on the RF side. I will talk. Uh, I will talk. I will come back to that uh, for as a comparison with whole effect at the end of my diagnostics uh, point. First of all. Very, sh very uh, quickly, because it's an ongoing work, I will talk about plasma diamagnetism measurement because it's very specific to RF thruster. So um, basically what you have to understand is uh, in a RF uh, plasma, uh, in a plasma in a magnetic field, the electrons are turning around the magnetic field lines. So they act like small dipoles, okay, magnetic dipoles. And so basically the plasma is a magnet, okay? If you put a plasma, in the magnetic field, the plasma itself is a magnet. And so when you shut off the plasma, for example, when you shut off the power that creates the plasma, these magnetic fields will go to zero. And so you will, if, if you have a measurement device around that plasma, you will see a variation of flux, uh, and you will be able to see this variation of uh, basically this disappearance of, the, of, of magnetic field due to the plasma uh, being shut off. And so that's uh, an experiment that, uh, that is going on right now on an RF thruster. So here is a, a ECR RF thruster, and we put uh, what we call a, a coil, a measurement coil, a diamagnetic coil around the thruster to measure, when we shut off the plasma, to measure the brusque variation of uh, magnetic field flux around uh, in this area. Now you have to take care, uh, to, to be very careful about the material you choose, uh, because uh, when we started doing that, it didn't work at all. And we didn't understand why. So first of all, there were problems with the diamagnetic coil. If you don't care about that, you have lots of capacitive effect. So you have to be very careful in, uh, in how you do it, not too many, uh, not too many turns, etc. And then it still didn't work. And uh, we finally understood that when you shut off the plasma magnetic field, in a way, the diamagnetic field of a plasma, which is, by the way, much smaller than the, the magnetic field of the permanent magnet, but the permanent magnet, they don't vary when you shut off the plasma. So it doesn't matter. Uh, so when you shut off the magnetic field, you have this variation of flux. Then you have eddy current appearing in the uh, thruster structure. And that means that this eddy current, we are counteracting this, uh, the, the, the diminution of the uh, flux of the magnetic field. And so basically, we didn't see any, any, uh, any flux variation, and we couldn't understand why. And so what we did is we say, OK, we understood this was eddy current. Uh, and we say, OK, uh, we can go to a material which is less conductive. Maybe we'll have less eddy current. But then the problem is that uh, are we going to have enough conductivity to drive the plasma? And in fact, we, we tried carbon. And that solved the problem. I mean, because uh, it was really lucky that this is conductive enough to have the thruster work and resistive enough to remove mostly all, all, all the eddy current. So we could make some measurement. And this is when you shut off the plasma, uh, you see this uh, measurement in this diamondic coil. And you can uh, prove that uh, this measurement of flux variation is a proportion to any TE. And the interesting thing here is, as I said, is the, uh, gyro, the gyration of the electron that counts in this measurement. So you, what you get here is the T perpendicular, not the T of the electrons in a longitudinal way. You, you get the T perpendicular. So you have really a unique measurement of the, the anisotropy of the electron uh, in this uh, thruster. And so we, there were some measurements done, and we could uh, measure up to 35 eV of uh, radial, so lateral, 
uh, gyro uh, uh, gyration electric uh, temperature. And so this is uh, something very specific to RF thrusters. Now I will go to the last part of my talk on laser-induced fluorescence because that's a very powerful tool. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, measurement diagnostics. I will go back to that. We'll talk a, a bit in the morning. L LIF is uh, particular because it's non-intrusive. So you don't have to put probes that would disturb the plasma. This is like a focused laser, and then you look with lens. So you don't disturb anything. You just look uh, at one point of measurement and to see the properties. And when you, you, there, you can really see Density uh, for some species, yes, but uh, mostly not. But you can see the velocity, the mean velocity, or even the distribution of velocity. And so the way it works is you have a laser going through your gas you want to measure, and you have a detector, and the intersection between the laser and the detector is a detection volume. That's where you will measure the, your properties, and that's where you will do uh, the measurement. So uh, in a few words, so there are a few equations. I will not go through that, don't worry. Uh, just to say that uh, the laser has a, its own frequency, la, thickness in frequency. A laser is not a perfect uh, light source uh, at a single frequency. It has a certain thickness in frequency. Uh, but uh, the, it is dwarfed, usually, by the, the, the thickness of the transition line you, are want, you want to, to excite. So basically, you put this laser frequency inside this transition line. And so you will make an atom transition, and when the uh, up in an upper level, and when the atom transition down from this upper level, it emits light. That's, that's the fluorescence. And so what you observe is you observe this light. So you don't observe the laser light. You observe the light fluoresced, so emitted by the atom when it comes down uh, from this level. But the thing is that this level, uh, this light, is directly proportional to the number of atoms that were excited. So depending on how to excite, or if you are on the transition or off the transition, you will have light or no light. Okay? And depending about the shape you see the laser, if you scan the laser in frequency across the transition, but you can figure out that when you are at the center, you will see a lot of light from fluorescence. And when you are at the edge, you will see little light from fluorescence. And when you add, at some, and I will explain that, that uh, this line will, uh, because of the velocity distribution, will be broader, and that the shape of that will be linked to the velocity distribution of the particles. And then you imagine that when you scan the laser, what the light profile that you will get will be, be, give you be, basically the profile of velocity of the particle you want to measure. And so to measure, talk about velocity, uh, just a few words, uh, we're using the, using the Doppler effect. The Doppler effect, the same effect that you have where you hear a siren of a, of, of a vehicle coming in and coming away, and the, the sound changes. And that's the same principle here. And basically, when you have an atom that we excite that is standing, you excite it at, at its basic uh, uh, frequency. Now, if you have a velocity of this atom, you will have to move your laser to another frequency. Uh, and the shift here between the theoretical frequency and the, the frequency that you have to move your laser to excite is the Doppler shift. And the Doppler shift basically is a, a fraction of uh, uh, the velocity of the atom divided by the speed of light. So it's very small, but it's actually quite uh, well measurable. And so that, that's how to, to measure things. Now, the laser will scan all the particles at the point of measurement. And each particle will contribute its uh, own line shape. But each particle will have a different velocity. So basically, the fact that the particles have different velocity, first of all, they will shift, OK? And the intensity that you will get at that shifted position will depend on the number of particles there. And so as I said before, you get the profile of density of particle at different velocity, which means at different frequency. Now, it's a convolution process. So basically, when you have, uh, this is uh, the, the velocity distribution of the particle. And this is uh, the line shape, the perfect line shape of an atom. So this is uh, the process that I show here is uh, an illustration of the ma mathematical, the convolution process. So basically, you, you, you get the shape. What you will measure with your laser is the shape with the dot. Now, if you have a, for example, a laser which is very broad, uh, when you, we convolve it in, with the velocity distribution, well, you get a shape that is not the same. So you have to be careful what you do with your, with your laser and not to get a laser, a laser that is very broad. For example, a pus laser will be very, probably too broad because of the, um, uh, because of the, of the Doppler land width that you will get uh, uh, on, this, uh, on this laser. And now a uh, situation that you unfortunately encounter is that a single transition has a high profile structure in atoms. Uh, and that means that you don't have one peak, but you have a certain number of peaks. So what you measure, instead of being just a reproduction of this, 
Well, you see that because those, when they pass by the convolution in this uh, Doppler uh, system, you get something that is very strange to measure. So basically, your signal that you will measure by fluorescence will look like the dotted, uh, the dotted curve. And you will try to recover that. And so you will have to basically deconvolve this with the, the hyperfan structure. It's a bit complicated. And it can lead to, uh, obviously, a, a complexity of the method. Uh, but you can deal with that uh, in the end. And so I will do three examples. Uh, first, one axis lift. So we use here an SPT thruster. And just to show you, we measure on a whole effect thruster at different points along an axis in front of a channel. And you get this type of uh, results from uh, laser-induced fluorescence. Uh, this is position uh, from the, this is the exit of the thruster, okay, this is in millimeters, and this is the axial velocity, okay, and each color means uh, the density of the signal, the fluorescent signal, and is a measurement of uh, the density uh, of the particle that you measured at that velocity and at, at that position. And then you can see that the peak of position basically goes from nearly zero inside the thruster, and when you go through the exit, you have the acceleration, and then here, uh, the maximum is accelerated at about 18 kilometers per second and doesn't move. So uh, over uh, 12, uh, 15 millimeters, you have this acceleration. And now to, later, I will compare that. Uh, you will see that graph again. I will compare it to an RF thruster, an ECR thruster. So now I'll go to my second example of a leaf. It's three axis. So we did before one axis here. Uh, that gives the measurement along that axis because uh, when you have a laser, what you measure is the velocity projected onto the axis of the laser. And so to have not only one axis but three axis and therefore the vector, you need three lasers. And so you, that can be implemented. Here you have a thruster mounted on translation stage. This is the cesium thruster at the, at the time. Uh, you add uh, three lasers uh, or oriented like that. So here is uh, an illustration of the fluorescence of these lasers. The optics of detection, the calibration uh, systems with the... So that makes something complicated like that, okay? <laughs> so it's not as simple as before, but it's, it works. And of course, you add uh, the hyperfine uh, system that I talked before, okay, little detail, but here it's the truth. There are uh, indeed all those hyperfine levels and hyperfine uh, transition that you have to deal with. But if you know, don't care about really the distribution, just the mean velocity, it doesn't count. Just, but it was just to show you the complexity. And then you get this type of results. In the sense for cesium, we are lucky, we can do the density. So you have a density map, point by point. And here you have the velocity vector, the mean velocity vector. Now you think you have everything here. But in fact, you don't have everything. And that's the third method I wanted to talk about. And that's 3D velocity distribution function LIF. So follow me. Um, you have, I will do it in 2D, okay? But it's very simple. The key point here is a plasma or, or a plume, plasma plume is not a fluid. So we're all used to fluids, and that's why it's, it's confusing sometimes. And a fluid is water. At one point, there is one velocity, okay? For, for a low pressure beam, you don't necessarily have one velocity at one point. And I take this example in 2D. This is X and Y, and you have a beam going this direction at V0 and beam going this direction at V0. So you have crossing beams, okay? So the mean velocity, you will say, okay, is going straight. But in fact, you have two population of two different densities, okay? Now, if you look at the, the distribution that in the, in the what's called the phase space or the velocity space, so it's not x, y, it's vx, vy, where well, you have one population that is along x at V0, okay? And one population that is along y at V0, okay? And when you do a uh, um, uh, leaf, uh, basically a, a, a leaf uh, or a projection over uh, axis of, of, over the, along the, the uh, x axis, for example, you, you have a laser shining this way, okay? You project that, you get one peak here from this population and one peak here for this population, okay? Now, if you have this situation where you have uh, a population going straight and a population that is uh, uh, static, in the velocity space, you have this static population, it's a zero Vx, Vy, okay, it's this dot. And this one, but basically, it has uh, some Vx and some Vy, it's here, okay? But when you put the same laser along the x direction, so you look at the projection of that along the x direction, you will get the same, exact same signal of laser-induced fluorescence that you get before. So with the one axis, laser-induced fluorescence, you cannot distinguish between these uh, situations. Why? Because you have different population, different velocities. Even with two axes, you may not get that. 
Now you say, you say okay, if I take a, a laser which is straight in the middle like that, well, the projection will be different. Okay, that means you need more laser beams. And so if you have a totally, uh, that's of course maybe two laser beams in this situation would be sufficient, but for any situation you need basically an, in, an, in, an infinite uh, number of beams. And so uh, you can develop a method where you will shine a lot of different beams, so you will not install 100 optics, but you will move one optics uh, all around the thruster. And so basically, you will get the pro uh, each beam, you will get the projection of the velocity distribution over that beam. So you get all the projections, and then you reconstruct. Like when you do a CT scan, uh, you have a projection of your bones, and then you uh, reconstruct the image in 3D. It's exactly the same process, and we use, in fact, the same thing. So this is the setup. Uh, this is the setup with the moving optics. Uh, and this is kind of the result that you get. So let me just show you. I have a small video. So this is this is the moving setup. So it takes a few hours to do all that. Huh? <laughs> but uh, this is a time lapse of uh, all the scans that we did uh, to get that uh, the image. And uh, then if I get the right, okay, if I get the right. So this is uh, basically the distribution function that you get in the velocity space, where you see that, uh, in fact, you have a donut shape, OK? Uh, a donut shape means that uh, you all the, all the points uh, where you have a donut shape, because we're looking on the axis of this whole effect thruster, and so you have all the ions coming from the circular channels. And so basically, you have all the ions crossing at the center, and we're looking at this crossing center. And so there will look, there, 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 their velocity is along a donut. So that gives you a lot of information about your, uh, your uh, that's the most information you can get nearly about your distribution function. So it's going very deeply. Now application to this first thruster, we take the same thruster, we did some one axis lift, okay? So it's the first example. You shine a laser, look here, and we did a scan along the acceleration region in this uh, chamber. So what you get as a signal with LIF, you get a reference cell here, this is the cell that doesn't move, it is on the bench. This is a reference for you. And there, this is the lift signal that you get from your ions. Uh, and then you, you, go at, uh, you look at the point that is further and further and further from the thruster, and you see that you have this population of ions that getting further and further in the uh, frequency axis, that means in the velocity axis along the, the, the straight axis. And so you can reconstruct a velocity profile uh, and the potential profile. And so it's interesting now to compare. This is the result. Uh, this is the acceleration in the ECR uh, thruster. Uh, so velocity versus uh, length, I mean distance in the magnetic nozzle uh, in millimeter. And this is the exit of the thruster. And I put here the same scale, same scale of, uh, of exit uh, uh, distance, what we measured with the same method uh, with the whole effect thruster. So what you can see is that in the whole effect thruster, it was done in a one or two centimeter, the acceleration. But in the RF thruster, so this was in an ECR, but pro probably in a helicon thruster, it's exactly the same. And in the ICR thruster, it's also probably the same. You get an acceleration of the ions over a very long distance. 100, in the, here you see it's not even uh, fully accelerated, so probably 150 millimeter, instead of 15 millimeter in a way. So basically you have a region of acceleration which is 10 times larger in the RF thruster than in the whole effect thruster. And this region is called the magnetic nozzle. Uh, that's where a lot of physics is happening, kinetic physics. And I'm sure Mario will explain all of all everything about that uh, later. <laughs> uh, so we, uh, I'll, I'll let him talk about it. Uh, but th that's, that's one of the status, for example, of research of those thrusters. We, we're discovering where the ions are accelerated and what is going on as a, as a physics. That also explains may explain why those type helicon or ECR thruster are very sensitive to uh, the pressure. It's because of this very extended acceleration uh, region. And so in conclusion, uh, RF thrusters can be really disruptive. So that's, that's why we're studying them, because of their simplicity, low cost. They can, if they can, we can make them work, they can be really disruptive for the business uh, because of the low cost and reliability. Complex physics, not understood yet, not fully understood, or hopefully we understand a few things, uh, but we are developing a code about that. Uh, we have developed diagnostics on purpose for that, to, to understand that, but we still have to demonstrate good enough performance to be able to mount them on satellites. So there is lots 
of exciting research to do. So if you are students interested uh, into working into electric propulsion, that's a good field uh, to go to do a, a master or a thesis and a big potential impact on market. And finally, I will finish by a few, if that works, uh, it doesn't, ah, the transfer didn't go well. Anyway, okay, no problem. Uh, I will finish that. Thank you for your attention. Denise, thank you very much. Uh, questions? Hmm? No questions? Okay, no, I, I, can yeah, one question. Yeah. Yeah. Perhaps I missed it at the beginning. What size is the thrust now? Uh, it's two, three centimeter diameter the current th uh, thruster we're working on. Uh, the helicon are probably, uh, uh, it depends on the power that you're working. The one I presented is the one, the one. three centimeter diameter about. And have you already built a bigger one? No, we, we plan to. Uh, one of the problems to build a bigger one is the scale up. So we, we kind of, um, uh, uh, basically we have, uh, we decided to a frequency and magnetic field and build this one. And, and tweaked it to, to make it work better. Okay, we are kind of optimized, we're not done yet. Uh, but then when you want to go, uh, uh, you know, four times the power, uh, four times the flow rate, and so four times the area, so twice the, the size in diameter, then you have to, find one of the decisions you have to make is, do you also scale the wavelength of the, mi of the, uh, of the microwave with the same uh, size? So basically, do you also have to multiply the wavelength by two, that means decrease the frequency by two? So should we build a thruster for 2.4 gigahertz or, or 1.2 gigahertz uh, to keep the same, uh, the same physics? And that's not easy to answer because we don't have the models yet for the source coupling. And so that's why uh, in, the, in the projects, I mean, the work done uh, here at uh, in Madrid and Carlos Tercero or Tonera, uh, we're trying to develop codes and to understand also the, the physics by doing experiments to try to answer those questions. So, uh, yes, we plan to do, we we'll probably do like a blind test, uh, choosing uh, one solution. Um, but uh, right now we don't have the scale-up laws uh, available yet. But each way to, 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 to answer your question more precisely, yeah, the scale-up is possible. I mean, like, like a whole effect thruster, we're not uh, condemned to have a small size for some physical reason. Uh, we don't have that actually uh, right now in front of us. We don't see why we should keep, be kept small. And even bigger should have better performance, like whole effect thrusters, for example, like all thrusters, because when you get bigger, uh, you have fewer losses, because the loss distance is longer when you have a big uh, thruster, and so you get better performance. So what we hope is when you get bigger, when we know how to get bigger, uh, we'll get bigger and we get better performance. Okay, thank you very much again, Denis.